you mentioned George Lopez. Yeah, one of my favorite people in the world. And you're on his show, and what's this DNA thing he does? What? He sentences, so I guess, somewhere in Cincinnati, and they find out what your ethnic heritage is. Uh huh. And, uh, and you did that. In fact, uh, you did that, and, and Snoop did it, too. Y'all had a yeah. little on, thing, see who, who was blacker? And, yeah. Tonight yeah. is the night we have all been waiting for. Who is blacker, Charles Barkley or Snoop Neal Double G? <laughs> Both took DNA tests, and Charles was here last night to get his results. Watch out. Charles Barkley, you are 75% Sub-Saharan African. 75%. Right there. The 75%, that's a good number. That's Take that, Snoop Dogg. The moment we've all been waiting for. Charles Barkley is 75% Sub-Saharan African, a.k.a. Black. <laughs> Drum roll, please. Snoop Dogg, you are 71% Sub-Saharan African. <laughs> oh, my God, Snoop. Charles Barkley is blacker than you are. Oh, no. Charles Barkley got your ass by 4%. Oh, no. I want to feel like George Bush right now. We got to have a revote. This ain't right. <laughs> this ain't right. <laughs> hey, but Snoop. I'll just call you Whitey from now on instead of Snoop. <laughs> Issues related to many of the institutions in, in the U.S., it, they, you know, they're structured around race, black and white. And this highly polarized social political history actually was predicated based on, on, on slavery and segregation in the United States. You had to, you know, once you enslave one group, you then have to say, okay, this group is different biologically. Anti-miscegenation laws, which are the anti-mixing laws where they did not want um, uh, two groups to, uh, black or whites to um, uh, marry or reproduce. And then the one drop rule or the rule of hypo descent. I really like that rule because biologically it, it's, it has very fascinating implications. The one drop rule or the rule of hypo descent was a classification scheme, meaning children of mixed ancestry that were born in slave, during slavery were considered black. And that was important because they had to separate those kids from uh, the white kids that were, um, were, were, both of their parents were white and they could inherit, inherit the wealth of their parents. If you classified them as black, then of course, um, they did not have any rights. But that classification schema created so much diversity in the African American population. So much so now that you can have Halle Berry, you know, the actress, or, or Vanessa Williams, who's one of their parents are, are, is white. They, they say that they're African American, and nobody will say they're not. I mean, it's part of this uh, rule, this definition that started in 1850, the rule of hypo descent. And so, if Halle Berry were to come in here right now and sit down in the front, well, nobody would say to her, you're not black, <laughs> right? We would all say, yeah, she's African American. So, biologically, it created an enormous amount of, um, of uh, genetic diversity in the African American population. And it didn't start with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I like to put him up because, of course, if you remember the history with him and Sally Hemings um, and their offspring of mixed ancestry, and um, uh, this was sort of the standard during that time. So this was not some uh, atypical sort of behavior. And because of, uh, of, of men like Thomas Jefferson, we have what we call high genetic diversity in the African-American population. Diverse gen African ancestry, the antiquity, uh, that old gene pool from Africa, but then also gene flow and admixture with non-Africans. For the most part, white men. And we see that in the genome. We look at Y chromosomes, we look at mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited, and we see what we call sex bias gene flow. So most of the European genes in the African American population came through white men, FYI. The year was 1948, and the candidate was Harry S. Truman. And we bid you goodbye. Delegates from Alabama and Mississippi stormed out of the convention hall in protest after the party adopted a civil rights platform supporting an anti-lynching law, the desegregation of the military, equal opportunity for employment, 
and the elimination of poll taxes, which prevented poor people from voting. Meanwhile, down south, delegates who walked out of the Democratic Convention formed their own party. The Southern revolt against President Truman reaches its climax at Birmingham under the states' rights banner. The so-called Dixiecrats nominated the South Carolina Governor Strom Thurmond as their presidential candidate. There's not enough troops in the Army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. The pattern in the United States of genetic variation differs depending on the, on the local histories. Remember, the, the U.S. Was, was partitioned at one point by different European powers, countries. Right? They would colonize these, <clears throat> these areas. And so they all had a way of dealing with the enslaved African, which was rather unique in a sense, uh, the, the, the French versus the Spanish versus, versus the English. So when I talked about the antiquity of being African, the, the bulk of the African American gene pool comes mainly from um, uh, uh, West and Central Africa, from Senegal to Angola, Southern Angola, that's where 95% of the gene pool for African Americans. Now, that's very rich biological diversity in that area. About 5% of enslaved Africans came from East Africa, which is Mozambique and Madagascar. So we see, when we look at the genomes of African Americans, we do see some um, um, evidence of the East African influence, but the bulk of the influence is of West and Central Africa. Now, when the enslaved Africans were brought to the US, uh, actually, it was only about 500,000 enslaved Africans brought to the um, North America. And so from 500,000, we now have over 40 million uh, African Americans, which I find to be fascinating in just that short time frame. But when they were brought here, they went into areas where, that were controlled by three major European powers, the British colonies, the Spanish in Florida, and the French in Louisiana. Remember, we bought Louisiana from the French, the purchase, right? It was a fight, we were fighting or something, that too. But those three countries, had a different way of interacting with the enslaved Africans. And so many cultural, local laws uh, emerged um, that were unique to those, um, to those cultures. In, uh, uh, for instance, the British colonies, let's say in, in South Carolina, there were an enormous number. I think it was, the ratio was five to one enslaved Africans to, to uh, whites in South Carolina for, for a very long time period during, the, during slavery. Um, rice and uh, indigo was the big crop. Uh, in Virginia, it was tobacco. These were major cash crops. They created an, an, an economy. Uh, and they, that economy was called the plantation complex, which uh, was very agricultural, obviously. But it wasn't just slaves in, on farms. We had enslaved Africans in New York City, which was a uh, an urban area, it wasn't urban like it is now, but it was more, it was less um, uh, agricultural and more sort of urban than, um, than in the South. The Spanish in Florida uh, actually uh, were what I call absentee landlords. <laughs> they just said, just send the money and the sugar to Spain and you guys, you know, deal with what's going on there. And so there was a lot of chaos in Florida historically compared to the British colonies. In fact, there were a lot of fighting with the um, uh, white settlers and the Seminole Nation and enslaved Africans that escaped out of Georgia that went down into the Everglades, actually fought side by side with the Seminole Nation, in, some, in many cases, against whites. And so there's a history of that, and that's what I mean by these local experiences. And so when we look at the gene pool of African Americans whose families are rooted, family history is rooted in Florida, we see a higher proportion of Native American ancestry more so than we would, let's say, in South Carolina or, or, or um, Virginia. However, if we look at the last census, the latest census, I mean, African Americans are pretty much where they uh, uh, were brought. Many think, oh, during the Great Migration up north, blacks went to the major cities. But for the most part, African Americans are in what we call the Crescent Southern states from Maryland to um, Texas. And uh, Texas is interesting because we have Houston on the southeast, and then we have um, uh, Dallas in the, uh, the, the north central, and southwest is, is um, 
San Antonio, and that's more Native Amer um, Hispanic. But anyway, if you look at the Mississippi River, it's really dark, right? A large proportion of, of uh, African Americans are, um, are still living in that area. You go up the Mississippi and you see Chicago and Illinois, you see Detroit, and then you look out west. <laughs> you don't see anything until you get to San Francisco in terms of large proportions of African Americans. So, I, you know, I tell my students all the time, you know, there are not, there are not a lot of blacks in um, Wyoming and uh, North and South Dakota uh, and Oklahoma unless they're playing football or basketball. Um, so, like I said, the most part, they're pretty much where they were, where they were brought. Now, uh, this is what's fascinating. Hispanics, I'm gonna go back a second, African Americans. This is the last census, Hispanics, or, or the 2000 census, it wasn't the last one, the 2000. The last one is very similar to this. What's the dividing line? The dividing line's Texas, right? So we have Houston, African American, mainly, uh, and uh, San Antonio Southwest area, Hispanic, and then Dallas up north. So it's very interesting. Dallas is more European um, uh, uh, ancestry in terms of the individuals. So when we look at um, the census data that reflects people who um, are considered Hispanic or Latino, we see also um, a lot of the Mexican Americans, which have a lot of Native American ancestry, but we also see in Florida and DC, New York and Chicago, a Puerto Rican community too, and, um, and Cuban community. So those, those groups, while they speak the same language, have very, very different genetic backgrounds. And because of Tiger Woods, we could say that we're mixed now, right? So in the 2000 census, folks said, you know, I'm more than black, I'm more than white, which I think was really cool because when, it, once you really start to understand your, your, your family history, your genetic background, the variation that exists within your family, is you sort of appreciate all the different components. Congratulations. Uh, now, but you well, also was whiter yeah, than Snoop. He, yeah, you're you were whiter, blacker and whiter. And you're whiter. See, that's what Snoop didn't catch. I caught that. Wait, but see, the, you were 11% white. He was 6 but He's more Native American. So he but, actually, you're whiter and blacker than Snoop. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, pretty interesting good. that you can be whiter and blacker than the same person.